Some places it's the middle of the night I don't understand what that means Cause the world is flat It's a great big pancake We're just on top of a great big pancake This channel's gonna get me monetized Monetized Hey! How you guys doing? Good evening! That is a good question, Tucker. Promotions is something I really want to talk about. Well, hey guys, I know it's a little bit late. Hey Hugh, hey Drew, hey the flannel guys. That's my brother, the flannel guys. If you're not subscribed to the flannel guys, that's my brother's channel. Cooper, and Joe, and Adam, Raw Rebel Bear, Jeffrey, and Karen, and Nursing Jeremy. Charles de Matas. Trinidad and Tobago, man. You used to be my neighbor. Hey, Jeffrey. Hey, Rip. Appalachian American Homestead. All right. And Alan, the true. Tucker Promotions. Tim Huffman. Jeff. Dwayne. Bayou Bear. Michael. Steve. Hey, Suits. Texas Farmer. Irene. Betty. Fadista. Man, we got some good folks here tonight. I'm surprised you guys are showing up. I mean... I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, it's late. I was thinking, I don't even know if I want to do this. I think I might want to be tired now. Now it is 9 o'clock here in Central Time, but. No, it's actually, it's not a tiny sock. Look, it's, it's a giant sock. It's just crammed down over the microphone, so it looks like a tiny sock. This sock saved my life once. Don't make fun of it. So, uh, hey, it's good to see you guys. Hey, Josh. Hey, Wendy. Mason. Mason, the border healer dog. That's nice. That's a nice name. I don't understand what it means, but I, I like it. Alex. Who been? Boyd. Carolyn. Carolyn. Carolyn, I gotta tell you something, but I've gotta do it with, like, pretty music in the background. Carolyn, this morning, we went out to the chicken coop. And there on the floor amidst the compost, the debris, and all of the chicken. We found an egg. We found our first egg. We found our first egg. And it's all thanks to you. Carolyn kept saying, get chickens, get chickens, get chickens, get chickens. You gotta get chickens. Here's five bucks, go buy some chickens. Here's ten bucks, go buy some. She kept tipping me and saying, buy chickens, until I was so overwhelmed with guilt for taking those super chats that I went out and got chickens. And obviously, um, I, I do enjoy the chickens, um, but I was, I was a little like, I don't know if I want to build the infrastructure for chickens because I'm renting. I don't know if I want to deal with this. But my landlord said, hey, I'll buy some some fencing and stuff. You can clean out the side of that barn and turn it into a coop. It's like, all right, good. But I, I do. I, I mean, it's like a chicken bunker that we created. It's, it's a chicken gulag because otherwise they'll get murdered. There are dogs from the neighbors that run through our yard and they tear my compost to shreds. There are foxes. There's a panther. There are raccoons. There are rats. There are hawks. There are owls. There are possums. There are snakes. This is a very, very bad place to be a small, defenseless, tasty animal. So, yes, eggs. So we're finally getting eggs. But they, I mean, they've been paying for themselves, sort of, by making compost for me. And at least, you know, I don't feel bad when I throw out food. Because if, if, if it's like, well, I don't really feel like eating that half a potato. <laughs> Chickens will eat it, you know. That's uh, some subpar looking cabbage there. It's got more holes from slugs in it than I'd like to try and cut around. 
chickens. I don't think we have any mink here. I would say welcome. Zachary is listed as a new member. So welcome, Zachary. You've been around here for a while. Yeah, there is there are panthers here, Fadista. Everybody swears that there are panthers here, and one of my neighbors captured uh, an image of a baby one on his game cam, which is cool. It was either a baby panther or it was a, a black cat, but I'm not going to tell him it's a black cat. It was a baby panther. It was absolutely a baby panther. The previous renter of this house said that he saw a panther walk through the backyard. People in the neighborhood said they hear a panther screaming some nights, and their dog is just fighting to get in the door. So, yeah, cool, huh? I mean, I know that there's, I know that there's rattlesnakes and moccasins. But anyhow, the chickens have a bunker, and I'm not putting the chickens on YouTube really that much. I'm not going to talk about raising chickens and stuff because people are just freaks about animals. People are just obnoxious about it. So I'll probably show the chickens occasionally because they're awesome, but. People are like, how many square feet do you have per chicken? I'm like, well, more than where you buy your eggs. They have like a half a square foot each, okay? But there's a lot of airspace if you stack them. Yeah, so. I like I like rabbits, but I don't like raising them. I, the, we had a lot of problems with rabbits getting sick and stuff when we tried to raise them before. I don't, I don't know if we just weren't good at it or what. I didn't really enjoy killing rabbits either. I, I did kill a lot of rabbits, but I, I like, I don't know. Um, if the kids wanted to raise rabbits, I would say, yeah, go for it. But they did not pay for themselves when we had them. So this evening's topic is improving soil with cover cropping. Somebody posted on my recent video where I was showing how to super improve a garden bed. Somebody posted on there and said, um, no offense, but this is really the wrong time of year to show this. Like people aren't building beds right now. And I, I don't take offense at that, but the way my YouTube works is, is <laughs> if I have something that I need to do in the garden or something that I'm thinking about, uh, or something that, that I, I want to try, I do it and I film it. And for people that know me personally, I am not an organized schedule by the book, by the calendar type of person, which is why it worked so well for me to live in the tropics where everything was manana. And the, the sundown to sunset was the same every day. And you could plant at any time of the year. I could be like, today is the day I'm going to plant corn. And I could go plant corn. Today is the day I'll plant some, I don't know, whatever. But, you know, in this particular case, it may not be in whatever Yankee hellhole that she's from, it may not be the time of year to prepare garden beds. She said that people were you know, still harvesting their spring gardens. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. But I needed to do it. I needed to put in my, my cover crop. I noticed and I learned when I was in Florida that there's really two distinct seasons for cover cropping. There's the warm season cover crops and there's the cool season cover crops. Now, I don't know that that's not some huge revelation to most of you, but there is a... There is a winter set of cover crops and a summer set of cover crops. And ideally with my cover crops, what I like to do is be filling up the beds in the period of time that I am not actively gardening on them for the most part. So um, maybe buckwheat might cover an area when I'm in between crops or you know, I, I harvest the rest of the Seminole pumpkins and they're looking pretty bad. And it's getting towards November. Well, I throw down some grain rye, throw in some lentils, throw in some field peas, that kind of thing. Throw that stuff out there and let it grow through the cold season when I'm not doing the big garden thing. And in the case of the summer, 
I pulled out my spring stuff from that bed. I had some collards and beets I didn't feel like eating. Uh, mostly chewed up. And, uh, well, hey, we're done. We had, we had already harvested the turnips and the radishes and the peas and other things we'd grown earlier, and it's getting hot. Now, I, I could push that soil and put in a bed of okra, put in something like that. You know, I could probably plant some more pumpkins on it or something if I wanted to. But by cover cropping it, I'm putting in an extra rotation there. I'm switching. I've got a crop in between crops. And I'm using that crop to recharge the soil with carbon and soil life and nitrogen humus, all this stuff is happening for the period of time that, I mean, what am I going to get? I'm going to get a basket of okra out of it, maybe if I planted it. Or I can improve the soil so when it comes around to my fall gardens or even my spring gardens, that area is full of compost. It's full of rich soil. It's got all that life. It's got that nitrogen fixation going on. It's got all the sugars that the plants are pumping down into the ground, feeding all of the bacteria. So that area is alive, full of life. It's an in-between thing. And I'll, I'll cover crop a bed when I'm only going to be keeping it out of circulation for a month or two months. Just putting a bunch of sprouting beans, sprouting a bunch of beans, letting them get this tall, chopping them down again, planting into it, is good for the soil. It builds the humus, it adds nitrogen, it adds lots of life to the soil, it keeps the roots pumping that good food down into the ground to feed. So, it's not the time that normally people are preparing garden beds. I don't really care. Um, I needed to do it at that time. So, there is a there's a, there's a thing that has to happen. So what do I do? I drag out my camera woman and I have her film it so I can turn it into a YouTube video. So that's why I'm doing it in the summer. Now when it comes to the end of my fall crops, when we get our first frosts and stuff, I'm gonna throw down peas and rye and lentils and all that stuff. You know? It's another set. And I can buy all that stuff two from the grocery store if I want to. So let me, I want to answer a question from way back here and I want to thank uh, Karen first. I catch these super chats. Karen says, I planted the first tree in my future food forest today. Star fruit that I grew from seed. See, that is just awesome. That is just so cool. What a thing. You were planning ahead. I have, I have some plants from Karen. I have a loquat from Karen that's looking very pretty. That's just so cool. And Karen sends another, another super chat and says, Dumped a bunch of rotten mangoes into the hole, covered them with soil, and then planted the star fruit on top of them. You're probably going to get mangoes growing around your star fruit. But hey, those mangoes are going to feed it. That's it. Uh, especially in your, your sandy soil down there. Any kind of extra organic matter is, is food. It's food for the plants. They need it. Good work. Uh, Michael, thank you very much. Michael sends a super chat and he says, "Thanks for your thank you for your advice and education about cover crops, broad forking beds, biochar, and composting my enemies. <laughs> God bless you and your family. You too, Michael. God bless you and thank you very much. I appreciate the I appreciate the tip. <laughs> Jerry says, Yankee hellhole. I spit out my spiced rum." <laughs> So, uh, all right. So, yeah, Carolyn says, for cover crops, it really depends on what part of the country you are in. A good farmer will put in a cover crop between every money crop so the farmer can recharge the soil. 
Elsie Chubby123 says, So you don't let them grow until you get beans. Don't let them grow until you get beans. I just pop those seeds into the ground and I don't worry about any kind of harvest I'll found. A harvest that I found. <laughs> don't worry about the harvest that I may have found. I just pop those seeds right in to the ground. Because my harvest is actually humus. My harvest is nitrogen too. My harvest is carbon from the sun and carbon dioxide too. So, there you go. If I get a few beans, that's cool, but it's not the scene I'm looking for. I just got to grow. So your idea is, you spend a buck fifty on a bag of cheap beans, man. You get some of them cheap beans. You chuck them on the ground. You got a bed. You get your bed ready for a crop. Fertilize it. Whatever you're going to do, throw some beans down there. A few bucks worth of fertilizer, a couple bucks worth of beans. You cover that bed, it grows. Those beans get like this big. Now you could go ahead and let them harvest and then cut the beans down on top of it, that's fine. Or, really your peak point for beans is as they're starting to bloom and flower and start to set their first pods. At that point you chop them up, till them under, whatever. It's it's a good, that's, that's kind of like the best practice, you know. But uh, there's nothing wrong with cover cropping and getting a harvest out of the cover crop. But I want to answer Taco Promotions question from very early on because it relates now. What if you plant your crops and the cover crop at the same time? That is a good, good question and I like the way you think. Now, it really is going to depend on the cover crop that you're growing because <clears throat> you can see at the beginning of the video on improving soil that I did, but that I'm throwing beans down a row of sorghum. So I am actually growing beans beneath the sorghum. I decided, you know what, I planted these sorghum too far. This sorghum grass is too far apart. I thought it might be drier. I have never grown through an entire year here. I'm learning. So I threw these beans down the row in between the sorghum and I raked them in to let them grow and cover it. I also threw beans down the row of my okra plants. My okra hit about a foot and a half tall and I planted an understory now of black eyed peas. In another portion of my garden I have okra and cassava and beneath them there is a cover crop layer of black eyed peas. I find that some cover crops are simply too aggressive to plant around something else. Like that sorghum sudan grass. If I decided I was going to plant sorghum sudan grass around my tomatoes, it would probably overrun the tomatoes and outcompete them. Grasses don't play well with others generally. They're, they, you know, that's, that's, that's a tough, tough stuff. But small tender plants. I have had great luck with doing kind of an understory cover crop kind of a thing using peas, lentils, chickpeas, bush bean, bushing bean type plants. Now I have also used velvet beans as a cover crop and they will absolutely grab and strangle and crush everything. I have used sweet potatoes as kind of a ground cover just to hold the ground together not necessarily a cover crop, but they will, they'll take over an area pretty good. But they, if you've got taller stuff that can grow above your cover crop area, so like a longer term crop like cassava, you can grow various vining things and nitrogen fixtures and stuff beneath them. They don't seem to fight very much. And, and I think different plants fight with each other in different ways. Uh, Different species don't set, don't tend to get on each other's case so much. You know, there's a, there's a, 
there's a problem. Like, it, let's say if you planted a bunch of turnips all close together. You plant your turnips really close together, and you get tiny turnips. Or you'll get a couple turnips that get really big, and the rest of them are really tight and small. That's not good. You don't want that. But, if you space them out farther, they each make a nice shaped turnip. But, at the same time, I bet you, if you sowed mustard at the same time, like, I threw down rye, daikon, and mustard seed. And the rye was pretty thick and green, but those daikons made nice daikons mixed in between. So, there's, it's not, it's not impossible, you know? Uh, Sweat, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Um, and... Also, Carolyn, thank you very much. <laughs> Carolyn says, now I will send Super Chat money for you to buy the house fund. Oh my goodness, there's a... Yes, you need a lot of bedrooms for 10 children. I'll tell you, it is... <clears throat> yeah, we're a, little, we're a little tight on space. But, I mean, we're blessed to be here. I'm not going to complain. There are times I wish, I wish we were in a property that I own so I could try some more long-term experiments. I wish that the price of housing hadn't got so insane. It's it's absolutely nuts. I just I just can't see borrowing a big ton of money to I just can't do it. I'm too cheap. But I'm saving. I'm saving and I hope that we get another housing crash. <laughs> so it comes out the other side. Flatjack says, I got growing mustard seeds on my list. Do they do well in Florida 10A? Uh, yes, they will, but they like the winter. Don't plant them in the summer. They don't like it. So 10A, I would plant them in November. You'd be growing them through the winter. Um, <laughs> you says, just buy an old hotel. <laughs> you know what would be really cool? It would be really cool that to, yeah, to have a hotel for all my kids and then eventually for my grandkids and everything, right? So we got one of these hotels. Yes, but it's got like that that central area with the old pool and stuff. You know, we could we could garden the entire middle of it. I just want to leave the sign up that says color TV. You know. Uh yeah, digging the foundations of a new edition. Uh, well, <laughs> yes, I have had my coffee. Yang says, lots of love. Cheers, and Mawe from Tropical Philippines. All right. Okay, Hugh, sell your house, and then we can start praying for the crash. So, but hurry up, man. So it says, what are your thoughts about the Ice Age Farmer? Man, I would love to have you here to chat. I, I've just heard his name. I don't, I don't think I know anything about the Ice Age Farmer. Um, I am kind of a little bit strange in that I'm a YouTuber that doesn't really watch much YouTube. Um, I'm looking just a second. I'm trying to remember if I have, I think I may have read some of his articles. Um, I do believe in the grand solar minimum. Uh, as I said before, my general, my general, um, approach to life is whatever the consensus is, is wrong. So you can just judge accordingly what I believe on everything that way. <laughs> um, but... Matthew says, I need my own lamb. My dad calls me a hippie <laughs> blank and says I need to get a real job. Okay, boomer. <laughs> oh my gosh. Do I still grow tobacco? Yes. Do I think it looks nice to grow even if you don't smoke it? Yeah, hummingbirds like it. They come back and take hits off it all day. They're like, I'm going to go go over there and hit that thing again. I don't know why. I just can't stop. They do love it, but... Pawpaws are doing well. They're growing very well. 
Um, so if you if you, getting back to our cover cropping, if you have a spot that is not doing anything, you got a spot that's sitting around. Um, cover crop it. Grow humus, particularly if you're, you know, I mean, it helps on good soil. It's a form of composting in place, right? It helps on good soil, but in poor soil, it's, I would say it's like a, it's almost a necessity, right? Do you really want to go and haul in materials for your garden all the time? You do a cover crop, you don't have to. I have planted, uh, I planted a mixture of brassicas and legumes, cool, cool weather legumes, chickpeas, lentils, that sort of thing, some years ago in North Florida. And then as spring started to advance and it warmed up enough for me to plant peppers and tomatoes and that kind of thing, I cut circles into it, chop, 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 chopped it down, made a little mulch circle, planted my peppers right into it. As the peppers grew, that cover crop died out. I mulched over some of it, I chopped some of it down, but it held the ground together, reduces the erosion, holds more of the minerals in place, created humus, it's building the ground, it's adding humus. So you've got maybe this much plant above the ground, but think of how much roots are un underneath. You know, it's crazy. Just, just, there's an unbelievable amount of biomass that's taking place there. So in the, like the John Jeevan system where you double dig a bed and you make your own compost outside of the bed and you, you know, you make piles of compost, you add a quarter inch or a half an inch of compost to each bed. You saw me do that with the chicken compost, throw the compost down on the bed. You have to go and you got to make that compost and turn the compost and, you know, finish the compost and all that stuff, which is great. I like making compost, but there's almost never enough compost for the amount of gardens that I do. So the, the solution is to grow compost right in the beds. Grow the stuff, grow compost. Grow stuff that you could chop and drop into bits and drop on the ground. The roots beneath the ground rot away. The stuff that falls on the top rots away. And uh, I know people don't like it when I talk about tilling, but if you till under a cover crop, stuff rots down so fast into the ground and it makes the ground fluffy and it adds humus and it, add com it adds compost and it builds the soil up. And then when you plant your annuals on top of it, they are thrilled that you did that. It works great. So, you know, think of what you could cover a bed with in in-between times. So, I like in the spring and fall, I love buckwheat. I was not able to get it this year. Um, it was really expensive. I had to buy like a giant bag of it at the local feed store, so I just didn't buy any. And I live a long ways from any place where you could get stuff in the chutes. And now I noticed that, you know all that, like those bulk dispenser things that they have at Whole Foods and stuff? Because of all the, the, the COVID people being terrified, they like stopped doing that at the, the Whole Foods market. I, I went to a one uh, 45 minutes south of here when I was in town. And I was like, gosh, where are all those shoots and bins that were so great? Oh, they're all closed because of COVID. Like you're gonna get COVID from the yogurt dipped almonds. I don't know, but apparently it's terrifying now. So I couldn't buy any buckwheat seeds. And then previously what I would do is like, you could buy buckwheat, right? For like the people that grind it, they had all this stuff, you know, the rye and the wheat and the hard red wheat and the spring wheat and the ancient wheat and the super duper wheat and the gluten free wheat, I don't know. So they had all these, these bin things and you could just go shoop and you could fill a bag up. Now I always thought that was magical. Like that's the best of America. Is that like you can put chocolate pretzels into a bag and buy them by the pound and but well it's actually they're actually health food pretzels you know because they're like gluten free or something so but i can't do that can't do that anymore 
I was greatly disappointed. So I went to the feed store and asked them if they had buckwheat, but they only had like 50 pound bags. I don't need 50 pounds of buckwheat. Like literally no one needs 50 pounds. Okay, well, if you had a big field, but anyhow, it was frustrating. But I used to get all kinds of cool stuff from there. So, I buy my cover crop seeds um, from like seed sellers. But I could still get the cover crop stuff like, um, I could get, from the feed store, I can get oats, winter rye, clover, couple of other things um, and from the just the regular grocery store I could get um, I could get just you know all your regular dry bean stuff peas beans lentils all those sprout you know split peas don't sprout but <laughs> most of the rest of the stuff does <laughs> but you just get a bag of dry stuff right you know, yeah, Gypsy says you'd have to find someone to split the cost at 50 pounds. You're right. <laughs> COVID has convinced you. It, it, it's inconvenienced me. Uh, but it's inconvenienced a lot of people. So, anyhow, the, uh, the beds, I've got my summer stuff. And the summer stuff, I'll tell you, the one cover crop that really goes through the summer is the uh, the southern peas, black-eyed peas, clay peas, crowded peas, um, all them peas, right? Zip of peas. Those guys, they just are unbelievable. They go through the heat. They make the biomass. They fix the nitrogen. They sail through diseases and problems. They're unbelievable. Great stuff. Um, in the winter, my top cover crop is rye. Rye. So, um, winter rye, not, 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 not rye grass, but winter rye is good stuff. So, um, along with that, if I can, in the winter, I like to mix in daikons and radishes and sometimes I'll throw some leaf vegetables in there too if I get extra packets of kale that kind of thing I throw them out there because I figure I'm gonna we'll just pick through them and eat them I pulled out some of the daikons from the cover crop and ate them you know um, Texas farmer thank you very much Texas farmer says sends a super chat and says order your bulk stuff from Azure standard it will change your life I never go to the store anymore I kind of like going to the store I kind of I find it insulting that that like I can't go buy camera stuff from a camera store anymore. And I can't find a local coin, coin store, you know, that kind of thing. I used to be a, a coin collector. I'd love to take my kids to an old-fashioned coin store. Go see all the cool stuff, all the old American coins and things, but... Eh. Alright, so I am saving it. Parcel carry, okay. Cool, Azure, thank you very much, Texas Farmer. I, that may help me out there. I like bulk food. I have a lot of children. I'm gonna try and buy an entire cow this next week. I think that would be a, we would probably eat an entire cow in half a year <laughs> or less. It's terrible. It's terrifying. If I, I one day I should I should have my my wife come in and run through what we actually buy in groceries per week. I mean, we grow our vegetables, but we don't have a cow, so we buy milk. One day we might get a cow. If civilization collapses much further, I'm getting a cow. If it gets to the point where like you can't travel, like we can't go travel to see our family down in South Florida. I'm just going to get a cow and hunker down because, I mean, five gallons of milk a day, I'm getting a cow. But right now, it's like, you, you know, you got to milk a cow, right? You can't just, you can't just like let your neighbor watch the cow. Hey, would you go feed, would you go feed Goldie for us? Go, okay, would you milk Goldie for us too? Okay, don't get behind her, she'll brain you. But it's, 
it's really easy. Goldie, Goldie, come, come here, Goldie. All right, Goldie. Goldie is 1,500 pounds. She's really, really sweet. Just don't get behind her, like I said. You know, I mean, you've got to teach people this stuff. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to get a, I'm going to put a whole cow in the freezer. <laughs> the good family food schedule. I'll tell you, we, we, we grow so many dollars in vegetables. It's, it's a huge blessing. And as you see, my, my method, my method of gardening is to plant a wide variety of foods. I'm not necessarily interested in getting massive production of any one food. But when you can go out into the garden and you can pick three or four different varieties of peppers, multiple summer squash, eggplant, multiple varieties of tomatoes, fresh herbs, you can pick flowers, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, asparagus, greens, cabbages, beans, okra. And it's just like, you just go down each row and you get this beautiful mess of stuff. Uh, we bring in these baskets that are just loaded with all kinds of food. It's not like a huge mess of any one food usually. Sometimes it comes and goes. But I love to just go, hey, what are we a little short on? Hey, it would be fun to grow some more beans, pop some more beans in. Except potatoes. And I'll tell you why we grew potatoes. It's because um, potatoes will save you in the advent of civilizational collapse. That's another one that is a survival staple. So where the potatoes were, back to our topic, where the potatoes were, I have sedan sorghum grass growing right now as a cover crop in between. And what I'm going to have to try and do, if I don't broad fork the whole area, I'm going to see if I can get a subsoiler to break the ground up out there because I am convinced that the compaction of the ground decreased my yields. And I would love to run a subsoiler. And when we subsoil, also smash in, smash in some biochar and lots of cover crops. You've seen how bad my soil is. I mean, when Scott Head came over and visited, he's like, this is really bad. <laughs> this is really bad. Uh, you can get five gallons from a single cow, Trader Monkey. Um, if it's a Holstein, it's like three from a Jersey, two to three. Depends on the cow, but it's pretty impressive. So... There is a great advantage to filling in any empty space that you have with some sort of cover crop. Sometimes it makes sense just to have a bed filled with some sort of biomass producing plant that you can chop up and feed to other things. I do this with Moringa and Tithonia diversifolia in particular. The Tithonia diversifolia is also known as tree marigold. Between those two, there's a lot of really good quality biomass. Some plants like collards, right? When, I, when the collards got so full of bug holes and rot because it got later in the season and we got tired of eating collards, the collards get chop, 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 chopped into pieces with a machete and sprinkled across the ground. The roots, I want the roots to stay in the ground. I want all the shredded bits to stay in my gardens. Having the gardens too clean is not what I necessarily want, particularly in the areas where I'm growing the grocery row gardens. And speaking of grocery row gardens, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you guys a question here. So, Multiple people have asked me, David, when are you going to write your book on the grocery row garden system? And I say, well, so-and-so, who is my favorite commenter on YouTube, I am waiting until I have worked the bugs out of it and I have a good system going before I write the book. I like to have things well tested. 
I t I st I'll tell you, I started the system at the beginning of 2020 in Grenada, in the Caribbean, using tropical plants and a mixture of vegetables. Bananas, cassava, papaya. Oh man, I miss papaya. I miss growing papaya. And I miss growing bananas. But I had this system and that was part of the, the, the basis of it. And when I started it, I had four foot wide pads, or I had two foot wide pads and four foot wide beds. I realized that those pads were not wide enough. We got basically kicked out, kicked out of the tropics and whipsawed all the way over to lower Alabama, zone eight. Very different, very different growing zone, very different soil. But I said, you know what? I'm not gonna let this stop me. I want to keep working on this system. So I rebuilt the system this year. Uh, well, uh, watch it take, take America back. Uh, just watch your language. We have kids watching. So I thought I'm going to rebuild the system here and see how it works. Well, the, you know, the trees have not come in yet. The trees are doing fine. They're not coming in yet. I have not been building on the system for a very long time. I only have two years and not even full years of experience on the system. And it's built on some of my previous thinking about edible hedges. It's built on what I was reading and seeing from Ernst Goetsch, which is funny because I was designing this system and somebody said, oh, that's just like Ernst Goetsch. And I'm like, what is that? Who's, who's that? He's the syntropic farming guy. And then one of you sent me a ton of information on syntropic farming. And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's like reading my mind. But as I read deeper into his system, I realized it was way more organized and time oriented than the sort of system I was dreaming up. I was dreaming up a lazy man's food forest, a half organized food forest system that solves the problem of having edges, that solves the problem of not knowing where stuff is, solves the problem of orchard versus annuals. And, and so it's got aspects of Stephen Subcowiak's permaculture orchard. And I, I would say that after having read the data and watched the videos and and seen more information on centropic farming, I've definitely incorporated some of those ideas. Um, particularly the use of bananas down in the tropics, very, very useful. So anyhow, all this to say, people, multiple people have asked me to write a book on it, but I don't feel comfortable writing a book on it at, that, at this point. But I could write a booklet on the concept and later, after I've worked some more details out, you know, rewrite it and make a full book on it, I could put a little booklet up for sale. Like, uh, print a, um, you know, a 10 to 15,000 word, this is what I did and how I'm doing it. These are my ideas. This is what I'm experimenting with. This is why I did this. This is how you could do this. This is how it would probably work, you know, in a temperate, more temperate climate. This is how it would work in a tropical climate. I could give you the overview. I am 95% certain that this is an awesome form of gardening. It works really, really well. It's beautiful. It solves a lot of problems. But I feel like there's more that I want to experiment with, you know. So, I, I'm just, uh, what do you guys think? I mean, I could, I could basically write up a long essay with some illustrations in it and make a little booklet out of it. You guys want me to do a little booklet like the, the grocery store gardening manifesto? So let me know if that seems like it's something you want me to do, I will take a week and I will write it and I will get it graphic designed and I will put an ISBN number on it and I'll put it up for sale. I'll put it on Amazon. <laughs> but I, I will have to do that with a caveat of the system is not complete yet. I don't have a full idea of how it's going to evolve, say, two years into the future. I may change some things. So. I am zone eight right now. Uh, in the tropics, I was zone bazillion. 
Okay. All right, so booklet sounds good. Roy says, yes, south of the sticks. Jeff says, I got a lot of benefit from your tobacco pamphlet. GMA and D says, that'd be cool. Just keep playing with Nemo says, just wait. Um... <laughs> Liberty Not License says, that's going to take too much time away from our favorite musical artist, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes, I should be doing the album, shouldn't I? Great big pictures for dummies. Oh, none of you guys are dummies. I think I've sorted out the dumbest people on this channel already. They've left. Fidisa says, I prefer the more comprehensive book. Yeah, it wouldn't necessarily... I'll tell you what I did with Create Your Own Florida Food Forest. I wrote it after about five or six years of building food forests in Florida, and then I have rewritten it after 10 years. And it went from a 15,000 word booklet to now it's a 75,000 word book. So that's where I am right now. The truth says, where can I get a cutlass machete as awesome as David's? Uh, you can buy them on the Carnage in Grenada at the agriculture store. West Indies. Let me see here. Yeah, to be a good gardener, never give up, just grow something else. Absolutely. Keep testing, keep testing, keep testing. It's so much fun. Look, I'll never... There's no finished system. You know, Mel Bartholomew... Uh, in his original Square Foot Gardening book, it was way different than his later editions of the Square Foot Gardening book. He started the concept, he kept working with it, he switched it all to organic, and then he redid this thing and that thing and the other thing, and he kept playing with it until he ended up with the kind of the mostly finished system. But that was a multi-decade job. Um, take America Back says, Comfrey can't take Florida heat. It's not for Zone 10, I read. It doesn't do great. Uh, but somebody brought me some that was doing great in South Florida, and I think they had started it from seed. So the Bocking 14 does not do great. It hated Florida when I was there, but um, somebody brought me a bunch of huge ones to share when we were at one of my talks. It brought, uh, you know, some for me and everybody, so... Let's see. All right, so what I could do, yeah, I could, I'll do the booklet version of it. The idea. Yes, yeah, just keep playing with Nemo says, I buy it, lol, but at the same time, maybe a few years to gain a little more. That's what I felt like. That's what I keep telling people. Look at, look at, look at. This is just an idea right now. Um, I built it twice, but I haven't gone a year past the establishment phase. Somebody else owns the one that I built down in the tropics. I'm sure they've cut it all down at this point. But they're probably getting piles of bananas from it. Somebody wrote me and said that there was so many bananas on my property. I was like, that's kind of sad. So. Gabriel says, dude, you're one of the people who got me started gardening in my little suburban backyard. I wish I had a way to send you pics. It has grown into something way bigger than I ever expected. Um, here, here's my email. Send me pics. <clears throat> Kellen says, I stink at timing, so I decided to just plant something every day. Learning, killing a lot, some stays, more learning, more organic matter for the dirt. That's right. And seeds cheap. Seeds are cheap. Gabriel says, if you see this, why are my cucumber leaves edges turning yellow? Uh, that happens all the time. Cucumbers need a lot of fertility in the soil. They burn through it pretty quickly and they decline. They go through a short fruiting period and then they go through a decline and they die. It happens, I mean, I'd say at like 70 days they're declining pretty badly usually. So um, unless they've been fed really nicely all the way through. They don't do particularly well. Um, you could try foliar feeding them with something, give them compost tea, give them diluted urine, that kind of thing. They love it. Finca says, my corn is more than 12 feet tall, starting to silk already, and it looks like it's going to be nice. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> 
Love Cat says, my buttercup squash vine finally collapsed the clothesline. My buttercup squash vine collapsed the clothesline. We had to prop it up with a pallet and a pole. That's pretty good. There's, there's, you got some flow there. Yeah, it's not a mistake, Alan. I made you a moderator because you're always here. Alan, you have the power now. If you see anybody post anything weird, you know, you can, you can, you can, you can kill them. I, I, uh, I picked Hugh originally and Karen because you're here all the time. And then the other night when I, when I saw you here, I thought, Alan is always here. He knows the culture of this channel and everything. He's always here. So you're, um, you've got powers. Steve says, did you get the pics of the weird ping pong ball sized gourd things growing on my power pole? They're turning bright red now. Yes, I want cuttings so badly. I sent the pictures on, actually. Um, I got them. I, I actually sent the pictures on to Green Dean because I, I'm sure that it's a coccinia, but it's not coccinia grandis. I've never seen a circular coccinia like that. I could not pin down the species, but I'm almost certain it is co. Cinia genus, but I can't nail it down and Green Dean would write me back. So I should just post pictures on this channel and see what anybody can find. So <laughs> Liberty Not License says, I think we need a movement today similar to the Victory Garden of World War II era. Empowering people counteracts fearfulness and sows hope into people and nations. Yes, I agree. I think you should grow your own food. And I'll tell you what, I am not, this may just be my personality, it may be a severe failing. I am not a communal type, a team guy, a community gardener type. People write me all the time and say things like, we're starting an intentional community and so us and 20 of our best friends are going to buy this mountain and I'm like, run. No, don't do it. Build big walls. Don't share things like that. Um, it doesn't work well. It rarely works well. I worked in nonprofits for a period of time and I'll tell you, almost all the work ends up stacked on, it's like the Pareto principle, right? 20% of the people do most of the work. 80% of the people don't. 20% of the effort in your day gives you most of the results, 80% of the results. 80% of your day is a waste of time. <laughs> so I have found that if a family decides they're going to build something. It works way better. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have community, but almost all of the greatest things that have ever happened have been because individuals did it. An individual person had an idea or a goal and everybody says that's stupid, but they did it anyways and then it becomes something awesome. It's rarely a committee or a community or a democracy type of a thing. It's one person with a cool idea that really makes a huge, huge difference. So what I believe in doing is making very good friends with people and sharing information and giving things away. Bring a people plants, give them plants, give them books, give them ideas. But, if somebody says, hey, let's go buy this park and transform it into a community village of whatever, I wouldn't do it because people's personalities get stepped on. Some people work really hard, some people don't. Some people have some more ownership in it, some people don't. And then the people that work harder feel insulted because the other people aren't doing it. It always just is such a wreck. It's terrible because people don't work together very well. But if there's a little bit of your self-interest in it, like, hey, I'm going to feed my family, yes. And if you have extra, give it away. 
Obviously put some savings aside, but give it away. You had a windfall, right? I had somebody say, oh, we can't eat all this citrus. We just throw it away. Like, you threw it away? There's nobody you could give citrus to? Do you go to church? Do you go to a gym? Do you go to work? Is there a food bank in your town? Could you go to the street corner and put a sign up that says free citrus and hang it out there where somebody can get it? Give it away. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. It's, I think what it is, I'll tell you, I think what it is is people are afraid to do things on their own. I think a lot of times people are like, they want to build a homestead for themselves. Yeah, but they don't quite have the guts to do it. What if you and I bought a piece of land together? Then I wouldn't have to make decisions as much. You know? People don't want to hold up to the weight of their own decisions. They would rather, you know, like get a committee of people together and do stuff. But I'll tell you, it just, it's so hard to work with a bunch of people. Yes, yeah, definitely not Cusinia Grandis. It's round. But I, I think that, I think one of the greatest things you can do You want to change the world. Manage your own family and your own house well. That's the building block. You don't cheat on your wife. You don't screw people over. You don't lie to people. You you don't you know poison and destroy your land. I talked to a group of uh, basically hippies once and I said why doesn't I said why 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 do these big nonprofits and stuff spend bazillions of dollars lobbying the government to pass new laws about everything and trying to get big areas of land locked off to be environmental refuge and stuff I said the government doesn't manage those things very well I said, why don't you collect $2 billion in donations and buy a big chunk of estate and manage it yourself? I mean, manage it. Do something really cool. Plant cover crops, Matthew. But, I mean, I just feel like you're... That doesn't make any sense. I don't want to get sucked into a let's have meetings. I would rather go outside and garden. And it does. If you start making decisions on your own and you plant your own garden and you do your own stuff and you do it really well to the point where you have an ab enough ab abundance that you can give it away and you can show people how to do it, show people how to do stuff all day long. You know, volunteer and that sort of thing. But I would not share my garden with somebody else, like, hey, this is your garden too, anytime, you know, come on over. Because then it gets confused, you don't even know what's going on. It's crazy. <laughs> but I just, I don't know. When I was in school, when I was in college, they would do these group work things. Absolutely drove me insane. Absolutely drove me insane. Please don't make me sit down with four other people and come up with a project. I could have been done already. So, cover crops. <laughs> I, I try to cover my topic in the first 20 minutes. Yeah. Give it away, give it away now. So, Joseph says, I just started a new bed and put a cover crop on it. Daikon, rye, clover, etc. Good work. Uh, it may be a, uh, it's, maybe you're in a cooler climate than me. I couldn't do that right now. Balsam gourd? Do you think so? It's a dead ringer for. Um, I'm looking it up. 
It's a dead ringer for a Cosinia. It looks it looks just like it's definitely a cucurbit. question is, is it edible? Huh. I don't know. Does it have that huge, huge root at the bottom? Uh, if so, I want one. <laughs> that is so cool. Biochar bed's working well. Looking very good. All right, I'm trying to try. I'm trying to catch up here. <clears throat> Lindsay said your decision to have multiple illustrators in the new book and your inclusion of my son's drawing helped create a new generation of gardeners. More than I can describe. We'll keep buying the good. Well, I appreciate it. That's really nice of you. Lindsay, I had so much fun putting that together. and It is almost done. You know, we are only six illustrations away from having the 200 illustrations complete. And I thank my sister, Christy, for that because she took over the project and finished the organization. So it's going to be done. It's going to be printed, Lord willing, inside of this year. And it's going to be beautiful. Um, speaking of that, my last, the last of the Good Guide books uh, composed everything. Not the last chronologically, but it's the last one that has been transferred to Good Books Publishing. So the second edition of Compost Everything, The Good Guide to Extreme Composting, which is almost completely the same as the first edition. So don't go buy it again. You don't have to. Um, but it is going live this week. Maybe beginning of next week. It depends on when the printer gets their thing together. But I just approved the final interior and cover for it. So for those of you who have been wondering you know why is compost everything out of print it's not it's it's coming back in and here is my daughter's etsy shop if you want to buy some seeds i just dropped it in the chat you know i'm on the border of introverted and extroverted so i understand karen and love cat i like people but i don't like people that much that i want to be around them all the time um when I'm with somebody, I feel like I have to give them my my whole attention. And so I get drained after, if I had to like do, you know, multiple birthday parties in a week or something, I start to get burnt out. I enjoy it, but... Joseph says, what cover crops do you recommend for hotter climates? The two I recommend right off the bat... Um, I like this sorghum sedan grass. It's doing well for us. It likes hot crops. Regular sedan grass is good for that. It likes hot climates. Um, black eyed peas. And if you can get them, get velvet beans. Get uh, Makuna prurians variety utilis. If you can, very, very good nitrogen fixing cover crop. Uh, the, the tropical that I was talking about is Ernst Goch in the chat. Alfalfa pellets good fertilizer? Yes, they are good fertilizer. Um, they boost the soil. They add, um, they add some stimulants to the ground that actually increase growth. I would use it. Sarah Rambo says, do tree roots disturb your ability to grow veggies? Yes, they do, particularly like big trees, like oaks are very, very hungry. They'll suck out nutrients. But I found that I don't have much trouble growing vegetables around small fruit trees. So I'm hoping that in the grocery row gardens, by keeping the trees small, it's no problem. Hey, have a good night, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> Anita. Yeah, I understand. Anita says, my husband laughs because I say I could turn my YouTube friends off when I don't want to socialize. That's funny. <clears throat> Let 
Well, you guys, have a great night. I'm going to call this thing because I need to go to bed. But... Wait a minute! No, I got a super chat right under the radar here, Chris. All right, all right. Here we go. Uh, let's see. Chris says, super chat, and he says, in November... Oh, this is, this is a good question here. This is my kind of question. In November, I am moving from New Mexico to a property I bought in North Georgia. We're just south of North Carolina, zone 6B, 7A. I am excited, so excited. There will be new conditions that will be very different. David the Good, can you help me with suggestions? Yeah, I'll tell you, 6B and 7A is a great climate for all the stuff that you would normally pay for. From the grocery, we're talking peaches, apples, pears, cherries, and all kinds of vegetables. Okay, so I lived in 6B, 7A Nashville area for about six years. And I will tell you, that is a great climate. All right, Georgia is already known for its peaches. Peaches are easy to grow in Georgia. Um, you can grow peaches and, of course, pecans very, very well. Sweet potatoes very, very well. Now, what, you're, what you've got here is you've got a, 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 a climate with a long growing season. It's excellent for corn, for pumpkins, for beans, for anything you want to grow in your garden, regular vegetable garden-wise. It is a mild, temperate climate. So you're looking at, um, you're looking at a seriously good overlap between the best of the Deep South and the best of Yankee dystopia. So you can grow hedges of like Nanking cherry, sour pie cherry, awesome, awesome pie cherry. You can grow gooseberries. You can grow grapes. You can grow pears and apples. And you're not going to be able to grow citrus there with the exception of trifoliate orange, which is generally more useful for seasoning than anything else. You can grow good tobacco. You can grow great potatoes. Tomatoes love that climate. I mean, it's 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 a good climate. Uh, what I would do first is figure out where your drainage is good and where the soil looks the best in your yard, where it's a convenient location. Try to pick out your garden area and plant a fall garden. Well, let's see. No, you wouldn't be able to do that in fall. It's November. I would plant a winter cover crop. I would put, I would throw down some rye and hopefully it lives through. You could also throw wheat down. It's a little cold there. Sometimes you're going to get a freeze. It's going to knock some stuff back, but it won't knock the wheat back. Uh, the wheat will handle it. I would cover that area and then till it under in the spring and start making your beds. Um, Collect all the compostable materials, get all the fall leaves you can, make big compost piles, do some burns for ashes. You can send away some soil to Logan Labs and get a soil test that tells you exactly what your pH is, what minerals are missing from the soil. And then when spring comes around, you've, man, you're like already on the right track. Make sure you've got a nice sunny spot. Off to the races. Also do research. Um, call the local ag extension, ask them what trees are grown commercially in your area, what crops are grown commercially in your area, then you'll know exactly what's really easy. Talk to your neighbors, anybody you see with a garden, find out what they grow, how easy it is to grow, and just make friends. You'll do well, so. Thank you very much for the super chat, I appreciate it. I hope that gives you a good, a good jump. Angela's having trouble with nut sedge. <laughs> Everybody has trouble with that. You gotta pull it, pull it, pull it, pull it, pull it. 
It is not. It is a vining Makuna. You can also crush that nut sedge down um, with uh, car a couple of layers of cardboard and mulch over it. Jackie Floyd says, could I add the sol dissolve the Solomon's gold in water to supercharge the biochar? No, not exactly, because um, there is both cottonseed meal in there and kelp meal and some other things that don't dissolve particularly well. They're just going to rot. I mean, you could probably make a big barrel of swamp water out of it and let it rot for some months together, which would do it, but um, I just kind of throw it on. I've heard New Mexico is a fascinating place. Squirrel stealing all your peaches? Ha <laughs> ha. Boom. Hey, do you um you guys subscribe to my new David the Good Tunes channel? If if you have not subscribed to David the Good Tunes, you can look up David the Good Tunes, you'll find it. I think I have a link below this video too. Um it's got a song called Pop That Sucka. It's about shooting squirrels. Just for pretend. Garlic would grow well there too, yes. So do Jerusalem artichokes, a lot of stuff. <laughs> Tim says, wish you would have wrote a book for growing garlic and onions in the Sunshine State. Yeah, no, I did terrible. I did terrible growing them here, too. I did all right on onions. I have a bunch of onions sitting on the back porch. But um, the ones that did really well for us were an old bunching onion variety, which my daughter is actually going to be selling some seed for soon. But ugh. that's right. Pop those suckers. I'm going to pop those suckers. Boom! Self-defense, that's right. So anyway, guys, you have a great night. God bless you all. Thank you for the super chats. Thank you to all of our members. Thank you guys for showing up so late. I know some of you it's early, but it's kind of late for me. And I will catch you all soon. I'll try to do more live streams as I can. Until next time, may your thumbs always be green.